So as a preface to their major counter offensive in the east, the Russian army group north launched a major deception or a kind of a diversionary offensive towards Kharkiv, the major second largest city in Ukraine in the north. Now this uh, deception offensive succeeded in pulling out about eight brigades from the eastern theater. And this opened the way for the Russian attack and they pressed in their 96 and the 106 airborne divisions and they had perfected, they had learnt their lessons from the last two years in a very, very meaningful way. They now started using the glide toss bombs. The glide toss bombs which uh, uh, are normal uh, dumb gravity bombs of 1500, 2000, 3000 kilograms to which wings are attached and they strap on a satellite guidance kit from the GLONASS and uh, the, the, these are launched from 40 to 50 kilometers away and they glide to their target and they cause massive explosions. About 2000 of these had been used in Avdivka to clobber the defenders. You see the major problem is the drones. The Ukrainians had first started using the Barkatyar Turkish drones and then they had graduated onto first person uh, FPV drones, you know. And uh, they had made a significant impact in terms of the casualties they inflict. The Russians picked it up and now both sides are using drones in the mass. And may I say that these drones have created a revolution in military affairs. They, these have ensured that the legacy major tank offences of the past are now a strict no-no. You can't concentrate so many forces at one spot because one, they get picked up by the satellite surveillance, by the drone surveillance and then they get attacked heavily by anti-tank guided missiles and FPV drones which have taken heavy casualties of armoured vehicles. So, quite obviously, the Russians have learned their lessons. They have adjusted in a very, very meaningful way. They are using heavy, initially they were using, focusing on heavy artillery firepower, which led to 50,000 rounds of artillery being fired in a given day. I mean, that is the level of lethality and use of the medium artillery by the Russians. But they found that such levels of ammunition expenditure were unsustainable even for the Russians. They have produced 3 million rounds of medium artillery ammunition uh, last year. This year they are going to almost 4 million as per Estonian estimates. But the simple fact is that there is an upper limit and that also leads to the wear and tear of the artillery barrels. 2500 rounds and mostly the artillery barrels have to be changed. The Ukrainians are facing this difficulty in a much, much greater uh, hurtful manner because they have a plethora of equipment. So how do you get barrel replacements from France, from America, from UK and all the countries, Poland, etc., which have uh, supplied them with various calibers and uh, categories of artillery equipment. So if you are wearing out your artillery tubes, then you have to uh, you know, replace firepower with something else. The Russians have come out with the brilliantly innovative solutions of the FAB bombs, the glide toss bombs, which have again created a kind of a mini revolution on the battlefield and they have helped the Russians to capture heavily built up defences in the, in the built up areas, in the urban combat areas from where you can fight for years. Look at Stalingrad, look at Leningrad in World War II. Every building, every uh, uh, block that you have to fight street by street is a maximum uh, drain on resources. But the Russians have overcome this problem. They have captured Abdivka, they have almost taken Chasevyar and now they are heading for the other remaining major towns in the Dontesk province, Kramatorsk. Uh, etc., which is the last line of defense that the uh, Ukrainians have. So, as I said, now in the month of September and October, they have been advancing steadily. They are not using tanks so much to advance, they are using their motorcycle bone companies 
in World War II, they had motorcycle based companies, both the Germans and the Russians. They used to have the motorcycle with the, uh, with the side car in which the medium machine guns were kept, the Spandaus were kept and uh, they were very adept at infiltrating and getting through these very heavily uh, protected environments. These have again become meaningful because of the drones. The drones dominate the battlefield and uh, large tanks, large uh, armored vehicles can't get through. They, are, they get hit by drones. And now there is a combination of drones and artillery. The drones pick up the target and then the artillery and the drones attack them in combination. So the levels of attrition on the battlefield are becoming unimaginable. The United States uh, commander in Europe, General Christopher Coffoli, he said these levels of attrition are unprecedented. The levels of force usage, the levels of scale and size that we have seen in Ukraine are unprecedented. We haven't seen anything like this before. The last that it was seen was in the closing stages of World War II. So, the face of warfare has been changed with this uh, war. But what it does show is that though the Russians, the three army groups, you know, have started their advance and the army group Zapad, army group center, army group Yug of the Russians, they've all started advancing, launching coordinated offensive all along the Donbass front, all along the Donbass front from the north to the south. And they are making steady but relentless progress. In the last two months, they have captured about 750 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory, uh, which given the levels of lethality is a very significant level of advance. The point at issue is they are going relentlessly. They are steadily pressing the Ukrainians back. The Ukrainians have taken heavy manpower losses which they are not able to recoup. So the Ukrainians had to get out of this predicament. They had come up with, and Americans had told them to a kind of a brilliant solution. The American satellites had picked up that in the Kursk area of Russia, the defenses were extremely thin. They were hardly manned because the Russians did not expect a major offensive there. In fact, they had been threatening to launch a major offensive towards Kyiv and which had kept uh, the Ukrainians hypnotized towards that direction. And when the American satellites picked up these gaps, they asked the uh, Ukrainians to quickly exploit them. And they probed initially with just one brigade and they found that it was absolutely unheld, Kali more or less. And therefore, they rapidly built up about 12,000 to 15,000 troops and they attacked the Kursk. Initially, they made deep penetrations up to 30 kilometers. The aim was to get to the Kursk nuclear plant. But by that time, the Russians reacted, brought in their Marines, brought in their reserve forces, and they were able to contain this penetration. And slowly and inexorably, they are trying to snuff it out. The Ukrainians then made another clever bid to go towards the river line and to extend the front towards the western side. Here again, the Russians have managed to contain that. Now, the Russians have brought in about 10,000 North Korean troops, almost a division worth of North Korean troops, to finish up this offensive without taking out any of their force levels from the east, without diluting the eastern offensive, they want to relentlessly finish up this penetration in Kursk. But now comes a very serious question. Why have the Russians been forced to use North Koreans? 10,000. 10,000 which is about a division. Now, quite obviously, uh, you know, all uh, armies which haven't fought for a long time, they want to gain combat experience. World War II, we had seen this happening in Spain. In the Korean conflict itself, the Chinese had intervened with their so-called Chinese volunteer forces. The Russians had sent their combat pilots to fly uh, attack sorties in uh, uh, Korea. So, uh, now the Koreans are paying back that uh, debt of gratitude. They have sent 10,000 of their troops to fight in 
Kursk salient, which is the Russian portion where the Ukrainians have attacked, right? But here is a serious, serious uh, point to ponder. The Russians seem to be at the, uh, though they are, their manpower situation, their industrial mobilization is far, far ten times better than that of the Ukrainian. But even they are uh, somehow very strange reaching an upper limit uh, in terms of manpower. The fact is they have now mobilized up to over a 1.1 million, 1.2 million force levels. What they have put in Ukraine is about 500,000 with about 3,000 tanks, 9,000 uh, what you call uh, infantry combat vehicles and about 5,000 artillery guns and 2,500 rocket artillery. That is what is the force level they have committed to Ukraine. Bulk of it is, is in eastern Ukraine. Bulk, matlab, almost 90% uh, is in eastern Ukraine. They have refused to take out troops to uh, fight the battle in Kursk. Now they are getting the northern North Koreans. So far, it was being speculated that Russia, apart from what it has put in Ukraine, has about 250,000 reserves which they could use to attack Kyiv or to attack Odessa. And the world was waiting where this Russian main counter-offensive would come. It now turns out that these are not available. Either these are not there or, or the simple fact is these are the conscripts. And because of his political compulsions, Putin has assured the conscripts that they will not be used in a war because in the first year of the war, the conscripts, the short-term inductees suffered heavily. They are not really trained, they are not really used to the battlefield and these are the new greenhorns that take uh, heavy casualties. Major lesson for our Agni Veers, please. Short-term inductees suffer heavily in combat. So you need some experienced soldiers, really. And now what Russia had decided was to use its volunteers. They use 300,000 reservists, use about 200,000 volunteers to fight. But most of them have been committed to the battle in eastern Ukraine, where Russia is now pushing to finish the matter, capture all its claimed territories of Russian-speaking people and the entire uh, you know, industrial complex that is there in eastern Ukraine. Right. So, this is a bit of a revelation and it just shows how critical, how important manpower is in today's battles of intense attrition. The losses are frightful. So far, it is being estimated that the Russians have lost over 100,000 men killed and about equal number wounded. The Ukrainians had suffered 600,000 killed and another 500,000 severely wounded so as not to be available. They are so stressed that they are trying to get their uh, people who had fled to other countries to be forced back, to be brought back and dragooned. They are looking, scraping the bottle of the barrel for manpower. So why do we need manpower? Because if the attrition is heavy, entire units get wiped out. They have to be revived, resuscitated. They have to be reconfigured to fight again. You have to take out troops temporarily from the intense battles. The Russians, after 48 to 72 hours, rotate their troops, rotate their battalions. The headquarter remains the same, but the battalions are all rotated. Sir, if you have to do all this, you need manpower. India is blessed with manpower. But for some strange reason, we are one people who are insisting upon reducing manpower and going for weapons. Is Russia short of weapons? No, we are buying weapons. The rest of the world is buying weapons and equipment from them. But because of the shortage of manpower, they have not been able to finish this so far. What the world thought would be over in 10 days has stretched on to three years. And it will go on for more unless the manpower is forthcoming. This is the paradox. In World War II, from a slightly smaller population base, the Russians had mobilized 12 million to fight that great patriotic war, the Second World War. Today, from a slightly larger manpower base, they are at 1.2 million. And, you know, 
they are showing hesitation. Putin is showing a lot of caution, political caution. You know that if I use the conscripted manpower, it will cause heavy losses. Quite obviously, he is trying to conserve losses. He is concerned about uh, Russian uh, casualties in the war, casualty levels. He is keen not to let them go beyond a certain level and that is kindness. But sometimes, you know, as Von Clausewitz said, kindness in a total war can, can cause serious problems. And if Russia had done this kind of a mobilization at the start of the war in, in February 2022, this would have been over in a month. It has continued for three years and it is going to go, it's not over as yet. Though it is reaching end game, it's not over as yet. That is the significant factor. I would now reckon that to finish this, the Russian strategy, overall strategy seems to be to finish the business <coughs> in the east to capture all that is left of Donetsk and Luhansk all the Russian speaking areas they will liberate and consolidate in the east and if by that time Ukraine does not come to a realistic negotiation on the table and agree to accept loss of territory to stop their bleeding of their population, the hemorrhaging of their population is very grand to play to the media gallery in, Amer in America and Europe. But at what cost? At what cost? Zelensky's advisors are telling him to cut his cost now because if the political dispensation in Washington changes after the election, Ukraine is in serious trouble. Ukraine is in serious trouble. It will have no option but to but to go in for a negotiated settlement. And if it has to go in for a negotiated settlement, it has to accept loss of territory. You can't live in a delusional world where you, uh, Ukraine that is taking a battery. Almost every town in Ukraine, every city has been flattered. You know, 600,000 killed and others 5, 600,000 wounded. Half the population fled to other countries. This is devastation. This is uncalled for. And uh, it's almost a neo-Nazi regime in uh, Ukraine. Let me be quite blunt and straightforward. Which is now catching hold of teenagers, old men and just, uh, you know, uh, forcing them to be recruited and sending them to the battlefield. How long will this hemorrhaging go on. It is reaching a uh, reaching end game. The Russians are determined they will snuff out this salient. But the most significant thing that has happened in the last few days, in fact it happened on 29th October. Elements of the American 75th Ranger Brigade along with some Swedish and Polish mercenaries, they attacked they tried to probe the Bryansk province of Russia to see if there were any gaps which the Ukrainian forces could, uh, could uh, you know, exploit like they had done in the Kursk salient. So, uh, I think they are trying to create some kind of optics because the American elections are on. If Ukraine is clearly seen as losing, the impact on the Democrats in the Russian, uh, in the American elections would be highly negative. So, they are trying to do some media stunt that can be pulled off and shown as some kind of a significant Ukrainian victory. I am afraid this is delusional. I am afraid this is causing the level of losses that it is causing to the manpower in Ukraine is colossal, is unimaginable. And for any popular government to do this to its own people, it is, it is a matter of this thing. Maybe the situation will, after the elections will become ripe for intervention either by India, Brazil or any of the uh, BRIC countries, China, they are all trying to intervene. India has made significant efforts to uh, mediate and uh, try and have a ceasefire by uh, you know, uh, they have spoken, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi has met Putin twice, he has met uh, Zelensky in Ukraine and he is trying to work out a peace formula. My 
Unfortunately, it looks like that till both the countries are militarily exhausted, they are not really going to be in a mood for peace talks. And only once the results of the American elections are out, will things crystallize. And that would be the right opportunity, the right time for India and the other uh, interested parties of the BRICS, Brazil, China, etc., to try and mediate a ceasefire, try and mediate talks and negotiations. That is the sensible way to end this conflict. But it is quite clear, given the military reality, that Ukraine will have to accept loss of territory. To talk of dictating terms to the Russians, that the Russians must surrender, etc., I mean, is lunatic, is a bit delusional, is a bit delusional. The earlier we come to uh, a reality checkup, the better it will be for the parties concerned, especially Ukraine and the rest of the world. With the induction of the American forces, the 75th Rangers Brigade, elite forces, they are being used and therefore the induction of the North Koreans may perhaps be the Russian reaction to the use of American, British, French, Polish special forces, mercenaries, uh, contractors in Ukraine, which has been going on from day one. Advisors have been there since day one. Uh, the Russians had said they were fair game. They have killed over about 250 NATO forces, troops inside with their Iskandars, with their bombings. And the Americans are now saying that the North Koreans will be fair game. So let's wait and watch. Let's wait and watch. But momentous events are happening in Russia. Ukraine war and the world will soon may have to turn its gaze from the Middle East to the Russia-Ukraine theatre of war once again because major significant changes seem about to happen. Seem about to happen in that three-year-long the most intense conflict the world has seen since the Second World War. Thank you.